he gets an alert on his phone and he says, oh shit, the president of Iran is presumed dead in a plane crash. I bet the Americans are involved. And then this woman on the tour chimes in and she's like, yeah, either the Americans or Israel. I'm Stephanie Keith. And I am Tara Manjekovic. And we are unapologetically outspoken. Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. So we recorded Monday's episode before the big news broke on Sunday night. But in case you guys did not hear, the president of Iran, uh, Ibrahim Rasi, and the foreign minister of Iran, whose name I'm going to butcher, Hussein Amir Abdullahane, and six other passengers whose names I'm not even going to try, but they included the head of the president's security team, other government officials, and then crew members on board were all killed in a helicopter crash in the mountains over the weekend. So this helicopter went down on Sunday near the border with Azerbaijan. Did I say that right? Stephanie? Huh, that sounded a lot better than what I would <laughs> say. So yeah. <laughs> I should really like we'll learn the pronunciation it. before we get on the air. And I didn't. I apologize. But anyway, they were returning from the inauguration of this joint hydroelectric power plant. And apparently the aircraft was forced to make an emergency landing due to intense rain and fog. And there were two other helicopters that were accompanying the president's helicopter. And they initiated a search for like 15 or 20 minutes after losing communication. But then they were forced to make an emergency landing. And then the wreckage was found on Monday morning, and it was confirmed that nobody had survived. So, Stephanie, when I heard about this crash, I was in Prague, and I was doing this historical tour of this really cool psychiatric hospital, which, by the way, I have never been to a psychiatric hospital that's open to the public to just, like, walk around the grounds. So it was very interesting. Was it really creepy? That sounds creepy. It was, because it was... It was super old and it dated back to like the 1800s and there was this abandoned cemetery and it was really, really cool. But I get this news alert on my phone and it talks about how the president is missing. And then like two minutes later, I was with the group and there was another guy in the group who was from South Africa and he gets an alert on his phone and he says, oh, shit, the president of Iran is presumed dead in a plane crash. I bet the Americans are involved. And then this woman on the tour chimes in and she's like, yeah, either the Americans or Israel like this. This could be the start of World War Three. So I kind of laughed it off while like at the same time thinking like, fuck, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we did have something to do with it because we're complicit in so many assassinations. But the details hadn't been released yet. So, you know, whatever. So on Monday, I'm reading some of these stories and I see a BBC News article talking about how the former foreign minister, Mohammed Javad Zarif, told state TV that the U.S. was indirectly to blame for the crash because the aircraft was like this decades old American manufactured Bell 212 helicopter from the fucking 1970s. And the U.S. has had sanctions against Iran for years, I think since the 70s, which has prevented them from buying new aircraft or getting parts. And then I read this very elaborate article in Al Jazeera that was talking about all the aircraft crashes that have occurred, you know, with these planes and helicopters over the last like, since the 80s. And he was talking the article was talking about how these sanctions include a ban on Iran importing any planes or aircraft equipment built with more than 10% U.S. parts. And I guess they've been having a lot of problems for years now with their aircraft. And the article mentioned that according to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, as of April 2019, there were 23 Iranian airlines that were operating with 156 planes out of a total of 300 planes in the country. So like half of their aircraft are unable to fly because of a lack of replacement parts and they can't be sent abroad for repair. So repairs have to be done locally, but they have like limited expertise and resources. So my takeaway from this whole thing is like, don't get on a fucking Iranian plane or a helicopter because it's probably held together with duct tape. But clearly the narrative being played out by Iran is that the U.S. bears some level of responsibility for the crash because of these sanctions. Like, even if it wasn't direct interference or sabotage, 
But they're also like not saying what the actual cause of the crash is, except for, quote, like undetermined electrical failure. And I'm sorry, but like, fuck them. Like, where's the <laughs> where's the self accountability here? It's like your whole entire government chants death to America, but then you're going to complain because America doesn't want to give you parts for planes right. like fuck you. <laughs> I'm Agreed. sorry. That's so ridiculous. <laughs> so you have um, Turkey's transport minister that said that the helicopter signal system um, either turned off or like it didn't even have a system because the helicopter crashed like within, I guess, Turkey's jurisdiction for emergency services. So they were checking for that signal after the crash and there wasn't one. And um, of course, like, just with everything going on in the world, it's, it seems like everyone is looking directly at like Israel and the U.S. as possible culprits. And, you know, like you said, if the ex-Iranian minister is already blaming the U.S., saying that like our sanctions caused Iran to have this like shortage of parts and so now they have to fly without safety checks, then I think we need to worry because I feel like it does just add to the tensions, even if it's unfounded. And especially when Russia's Security Council announced that it can go ahead and assist Iran with the investigation into the crash, it just like, I don't know, it's just like, great. Like, is this just one more thing that's like, growing to like these rising tensions and leading to the next phase of this like global war that I feel like we're already in, but no one's really saying out loud, you know? Yeah, and I want to bring like a conspiracy element into this because obviously there's news outlets that are speculating about direct U.S. or Israel involvement. And I found this article on the World Socialist website and it was saying like, this can't be ruled out as sabotage by Israeli intelligence or the CIA because both countries have carried out assassinations of Iranian officials in the past few years and they like listed them all out, which technically Technically, we have. So then they were saying, like, well, even if it is an assassination, then Iran wouldn't admit it because it would make it look like their security is a catastrophic failure, which would undermine the regime. So, like, who the fuck knows at this point, right? But realistically, you've got an ancient aircraft combined with shitty weather, which reasonably would make sense for the crash. But Stephanie, I know how much you love a good conspiracy. So did you see anything about what Alex Jones had to say about the crash? No, okay. no. But you know, I mean, people think he's crazy, but he always ends up being right. So I'm very curious now. Okay, this is a very short clip. I couldn't find anything about it. But um, Real AF did an episode where they were talking about this, and this is what they had to say about it, which I, I wish I could find something. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's sad. And, like, I mean, there's videos right now, apparently, uh, like, and there's some weird stuff happening. I, I saw this. Um, uh, Alex Jones actually tweeted this out. Apparently, uh, uh, none of the weather data, because that was one of the first things they started saying was, like, there was some shit going on with the weather. Can't um, find it. They, there is zero history. Like they've deleted the weather data, the, all of the data from from yeah. that day. I don't think like twenty four hours that. prior to that. You know, like so. There's some weird stuff that's definitely happening here. And uh, so I tried to look up like you know the weather data for the date of this incident, and I couldn't find anything. Um, and I know Alex Jones has a podcast, and he did an episode on this, but I couldn't find the actual like tweets, whatever you want to call them now, X things. Well, I mean, I, I definitely like I'm not going to lie. It's the, it's the first thing that crossed my mind. But at the same time, like bringing in, you know, common sense, like helicopters crash all the fucking time, like the EMTs and stuff that that t do the um, helicopter flights have like insane pay and like life insurance because it is dangerous. Like helicopters go down a lot. So I mean, the I don't know. I don't know the answer. <laughs> But it's in the mountains, like almost yeah. when I was reading that Al Jazeera article, like the majority of their aircraft incidents all occurred in the mountains because you've got weather and you've got the mountains and, and helicopters, yeah. not, not a good combo. But right. like this begs the question, like what does this mean for the current situation with Israel, right? Well, I know. And that's exactly 
what I was thinking, because it's like we keep hearing that if we and I say we meaning like the U.S. or Israel gets in this direct like head on head conflict with Iran, then that will be the start of World War Three. And then you have like Putin and Xi Jinping that are referring to Raisi as like a dear friend and like standing with Iran. And so I guess it just depends on like what they come up with in this investigation that they're doing on the crash, you know, like where are they going to put the blame on their, their official, you know, investigation. And I think the reason it like popped into my mind that like, okay, was this an assassination was the, the just thinking about like Israel killing the Iranian generals, like what was that a few weeks ago? And with that being said, I thought that was going to be the start of World War Three. Like when we first heard about those Iranian generals being taken out, I was like, well, fuck, here we go. But it wasn't, you know, Iran retaliated. No one in Israel died from it. And so it ended up not really being that big of an issue. So maybe this will be the same thing where like it's not that big of an issue or it could go the other way and be a massive issue. And it's just like so uncertain. I, I have no idea what to think about this right now. It could go either way. Yeah. And from what I understand, like, let's say there is no culpability from, you know, um, the United States or from Israel, like the death of the president of Iran is not going to change anything in regards to Iran's policies anyway, because the president has limited power to begin with and everything's dictated by the Ayatollahs and they'll just replace him with someone else that they select and approve. So it's not going to change anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, I heard about like Iranians were like, cheering that this guy was dead because he's known as what like the butcher of tehran he's killed so yeah. many of his people um but realistically in that scenario yeah you're absolutely right like the ayatollah is going to pick who they want to pick like it's not going to be someone that's like for the people and doing the right thing that's for sure um and i think too like i just can't overemphasize that the american people don't have an appetite for war like that is without question. Like nobody wants war. Um, you know, Trump doesn't want war. And now you have Biden that's like wavering his support with Israel. And it's just like, I don't know what to think about this, Tara. Like, I feel like every day I'm like a pendulum swinging from like one side to the other. I like literally don't know what to think. And it has my stomach twisted with the whole conflict in Israel and Palestine. And like, I, I know I'm kind of getting off topic, but I think it's important that we kind of look at this because, I mean, this is something that would put us into a war where we, the American people, have boots on the ground there, where our kids get drafted, that kind of thing. And it's like, I understand that Hamas had to pay for October 7th. I mean, that was horrific what happened. But then on the other hand, like, they're bombing millions of people and leveling Palestine. And it's like making me sick because... And I know you're not on TikTok that often, but I like every single day I'm seeing like innocent kids, body parts like blown to pieces. Like it's just it's so messed up. The whole thing is so messed up. And like I was hanging out with friends the other night and my friends like she, her, like she totally is in line with everything we talk about on the podcast. And she's like, I don't how am I supposed to feel about this? Like she wanted me to like tell her like what. And I'm like, I don't know, because I don't know how to feel. And she's like, I just I'm just so conflicted. And it's like, I don't know. Are you feeling that way? Because I feel like my gut is telling me that like the whole thing is just bad. And like there's just so much evil going on on both sides but at the same time, it's like if we keep going and Israel doesn't stop, I feel like we are going to be dragged into World War Three at some point. Like, I feel, don't you th like I feel like tensions are rising and I hear people that are very in support of Israel that are like, oh, no, no, we're just going to wipe out like we're going to clear out Palestine and then everything will be fine. But I like I am I crazy for thinking that like I just feel like. Things aren't going to be fine. But then on the other side, like when the pendulum s swings to the other side, I see what's happening here with the anti-Semitism and it pisses me off. It makes me so mad and it's alarming because it's like our country's turning into freaking like Nazi Germany and it's not right. And so like, I don't know if anyone listening is feeling conflicted, but that's where I'm standing. It's like, I want to support the Jewish people and our ally Israel, but at the same time, like 
every day I'm seeing these horrific things on social media and I can't just like be like, oh, well, like they're it's Hamas. You know what I mean? It's like kids. Yeah. And that's really the catch 22 is. But that's where I also have a problem with what's going on with a lot of these protests in America, because I understand and I support the idea of protesting against the killing of innocent people in Gaza. But I can't get on board with what I see as like the very obvious sentiments of hatred that have been a constant theme with these protests and this very blatant anti-Semitism, not against Israel, but against American Jews who have no yes. control over what's going on in Israel or Gaza. And it's like this overall growing anti-Jewish sentiment, especially with young people in America, that I find incredibly disturbing and alarming because I feel like as time has gone by, people have conveniently like forgot the fucking insane atrocities of the Holocaust or they're just not learning it at all because I don't think it's being taught in schools the way it was when we were young. And there's this whole other narrative going on. And it's like the Holocaust literally decimated a third of the Jewish population. It had a huge impact not just across Europe, but on Israel and all the people who managed to escape extermination in Europe and flee to Israel. And like even today, the Jewish population is nowhere near what it was before the war. And like maybe for me, it's constantly a prominent thing in my mind because I've been obsessed with World War II for like 20 years. And like back at home, I have this huge library of World War II books. And like even now when I read something that's not like personal development content, I'm usually reading a book related to World War II, either something about the Nazi experience or about the Jewish experience, because those are the two things I'm interested in the most. And I've been on immersive trips throughout Germany and Poland and other areas of Europe. And I've visited concentration camps and Nazi sites and memorials and museums. And since living in the Czech Republic, I've gotten to learn and experience even more of this history. Like, Stephanie, I literally live in a neighborhood where there are memorials everywhere for the war. There are plaques on the walls of people's homes that they currently live in where Jewish people were taken out of their homes and sent to concentration and extermination camps. So, like, I feel like I'm confronted with this shit pretty much every day. And I'm seeing it from a perspective that many Americans don't see. So I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but the escalation of what's happening with Israel and Gaza and Iran is all very complex. And at the end of the day, like I, I have such a difficult time getting on board with supporting or sympathizing with terrorist countries like fucking Iran and Palestine, these organizations that are literally committing genocide against their own people while Americans are protesting in support of countries that fucking hate us and would destroy us if they could. And like, frankly, we have our own fucking problems and we need to fix our own country. And that's what I, that is my thing. Because I feel like right now, you know, and and really, I don't think it's it's the people. I think it's the media, the people pulling the puppet strings that are like, we well, have to pick a side. Well, I don't want to pick a fucking side. I want to yeah. I want to pick America as my side. And that's where I feel like it gets all like twisted in my mind because it's like, no, I don't have to stand for any of this bullshit. But I had to tell you. So when you were talking, it made me think of like multiple things. So first of all, you were like, I don't know if um this stuff, if the Holocaust is being taught in school. And honestly, I think it's different like everywhere you go, because like my daughter, they went very in depth with the Holocaust. They even went to the Holocaust Museum and it was really cool. They had like um, AI that was put together by people that survived the Holocaust. Like they were interviewed and so they were able to give like their perspective on it. And so the kids could ask like all these questions and it, you would hear like a perspective from someone who was actually there. So it was very cool. But then on TikTok, I see this teacher and she's like, baffled because she's like, I am trying to teach these kids about the Holocaust. Okay. And she's like, first of all, all they know is Hitler and Anne Frank. They think they're like, what was Anne Frank, his daughter? She's like, literally oh like, these are the types of things these kids are asking. And like, they clearly had no clue. And then she's like, and as I'm teaching, like they have no interest whatsoever. And they're like, it's just really sad. It's like they there's such an important part of our history that wasn't even that long ago. And like mm -hmm. people are totally clueless. And then I see this girl 
who infiltrated the protests at the University of Washington. And she was able to get in and like pretend she was a protester. And so she befriends these like other girls that are protesters. And they're like, oh, did you get the number on your arm? And she was like, no, what's that? And they're like, oh, and they like wrote in marker on her arm. And she's like, every single person there had a number like written on their arm. It was a phone number to like a personal cell phone of someone with a bail fund. So that if you get arrested, you just call this number and they'll take care of it. So it's like even at that level, these kids at these colleges, like they're just puppets. Someone wants to make it look like, I don't know, a certain way. And I I mean, they're probably paying them as well. Like we know they're giving oh, yeah. them resources. They're probably giving them cash. Like, hey, go be an asshole and like protest. And so it's just like, it's so crazy. It, but again, it makes me like, just think who knows what to believe anymore. I mean, everything is so it's like one big theater performance. You know what I mean? But at yeah. the end of the day, I don't want World War Three. And I don't think any American does any reasonable person. Except for so, Congress. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I mean. And like and when I say like Israel, I don't even think like Israel. I, I think there are the people at the top, the elites yeah. in Israel, the elites in America, the elites in the EU that are all profiting because they're all part of the military industrial complex. You know yep. what I mean? And it's not like Jewish people or Americans or it's like this, this group of people that are controlling everything. That's, that's yep. what like gets me all twisted. Um, but I agree with you. I think like, why can't we just focus on America, America first? I don't think we should be giving our money, our weapons or anything else to another country especially one that has more than enough to pay for their own war when we here are suffering. Like we have people that literally can't afford their house. They can't afford food. They can't afford health care. We're in, what is it now? Like $34 trillion in debt. Like, can we yep. take care of that first and like just freaking stop sending money all over the world? Like I'm just, I'm sick of it. And I feel like I'm not alone in that. I think there's a lot of people that would like to see some focus here at home, you know, at least the same amount of focus as they're giving other countries. I don't know. I feel like I just rambled, but I had to get that off my chest. We both did. <laughs> um. So, okay. The other thing having to do with all this, now that I got off on that tangent, let's bring it back. Um. So on TikTok, I come across the Al Jazeera uh, account and they posted this video saying that uh, the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor is seeking arrest warrants for Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yuav Gallant. I don't know if I said that right, as well as three Hamas leaders. So I'm just going to play a clip so we can hear from this guy and what he has to say on it. Confirm today that I have reasonable grounds to believe on the basis of evidence collected and examined by my office that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant bear criminal responsibility for the following international crimes committed on the territory of the State of Palestine from at least the 8th of October 2023. The crimes include starvation of civilians as a method of warfare, willfully causing great suffering, serious injury to body or health or cruel treatment, willful killing or murder, and intentionally directing attacks against a civilian population, as well as crimes against humanity of extermination and or murder, persecution, and allegations of crimes of committing other inhuman acts. It's alleged that these crimes were committed in the context of the ongoing armed conflict and as part of a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population of Gaza pursuant to a state policy. Unfortunately, these crimes continue to this day. My office submits that these individuals, through a common plan, have systematically deprived the civilian population of Gaza of objects indispensable to human survival. We have reached that conclusion based upon interviews with survivors, 
many eyewitnesses, experts from satellite imagery, statements from Israeli officials, including the two individuals subject to the present application. Okay, so it says that a panel of three judges will decide if they're going to proceed with arrests. And this typically takes at least two months to decide. But Tara, like, what the fuck is going on? Because you have this, like this, whatever it's called, criminal courts chief prosecutor wanting to arrest them. And then you also have the EU sending their condolences to Iran for the death of this guy who's known as the fucking butcher that killed thousands of people. Like, what? Isn't that weird? Yeah, from from everything I read, like the ICC is kind of a joke. And like, as you said, they're calling for arrest warrants against both Israel and Hamas. And both Israel and Hamas are rejecting the idea. I was reading this publication called Al Monitor, and Israel slammed it as a, quote, historical disgrace. Hamas reportedly, quote, strongly condemns it. So they're both against it, obviously. But like if these warrants are granted, it would mean that technically any of the 124 ICC member countries would basically be obliged to arrest anyone with a warrant who travels to any of these member countries. And the article was saying that the court has like no mechanism to enforce its warrants anyway. And then I was listening to Ben Shapiro's podcast yesterday, and he said basically the same thing. He's like, the ICC has no actual enforcement power to do anything, and they pick and choose who they want to prosecute. They don't adhere to any kind of standard. And frankly, it sounds to me kind of like the Biden admin, but the United States is not a member of the ICC, neither is Russia or China or India, and it's mostly European countries, some African countries, and a few Middle East countries. So essentially, like America has no say in what happens with any of this. And, you know, Ben Shapiro is obviously super pro Israel in his stance, but I want to play a clip from his show because I thought it was an interesting perspective on the ICC. Warner. So, so what is the ICC? Well, it's basically just a left-wing narrative machine for a bunch of bureaucrats based in The Hague with no actual enforcement power other than the power of these nations. Why does that matter? Well, one, it creates all sorts of fun narratives for people who hate Jews. Equating Hamas with the Israeli government is, in fact, an attempt to put the Jews in the dock alongside terrorists, which is insane. And th that's clearly what's happening here. That's number one. Number two, it actually makes negotiations significantly more difficult. Because now every ICC member, if indeed this prosecution moves forward, every ICC member state will have an obligation under the Rome Statute to arrest Yav Gallant, for example, the Minister of Defense in Israel, or Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. If Bibi, for example, goes to visit Britain, the UK is a signatory to this. The UK would then have an obligation under the Rome Statute to arrest the sitting Prime Minister of a democrat democratically elected state. Already, this has provided an, an impediment to the to any sort of negotiation or talk with, say, Vladimir Putin in Russia. And of course, it's not really enforced is the truth, because thanks to Zoom, thanks to all of these other mechanisms, you can still have conversations. But this is going to create a much more serious problem because the Israeli government has already said, we understand who's initiating all of this. The people initiating all of this are the Palestinian Authority working through their man, who is this prosecutor, Karim Khan. And so they're going to cut off the taxpayer funding to the Palestinian Authority, which theoretically could collapse the Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority, which, by the way, is supposed to have jurisdiction over the state of Palestine, wherein they are arresting zero terrorists under the ICC's jurisdiction. Beyond which, if the Palestinian Authority, it, let's say that, that Netanyahu travels to Ramallah to have some sort of peace conversation with the Palestinian Authority leadership, which is not in the cards anytime in the near future. But let's say it were to be. The Palestinian Authority would then have the legal impetus under the ICC to arrest Netanyahu. You understand how insane all of this is? So what the, what the United States should probably do is impose secondary sanctions on the ICC. If the ICC goes forward with this, like we should not have allies of the United States as Americans prosecuted by the ICC. There's a reason, again, we are not members of the ICC. Frankly, it shouldn't have taken this for us to destroy the ICC. The ICC is a garbage institution that should have zero legal legitimacy. The reason the ICC, by the way, has never prosecuted American soldiers is because they know the United States will actually do just this. They, they, they're cowards in the end. And so the fact is that 
The ICC should be deprived of all international legitimacy because, frankly, it is a giant, giant joke. So there's his perspective. <laughs> yeah, like, again, I feel like one big theater performance, you know, it's yeah. like none of it actually matters. And so I have to go conspiracy mode just for a second, because something interesting I came across, and I've heard this before, but I found the actual article from Israel Today, and it said, quote, about 30 years ago, the late Luba Victor Rebbe told a young Netanyahu that he, Benjamin Netanyahu, will be Israel's prime minister, who will pass the scepter to the Messiah. The Luba Victor Rebbe said that this said this during the election campaign in the 1990s, before Netanyahu's first term in office. Today, Israel is in kind of an apocalyptic mood. Bibi is prime minister and the scepter is in his hand. Will Netanyahu, the nation and the world, soon welcome the Messiah? End quote. So like you hear that and I don't, I still don't know what to think about Netanyahu, but I'm like, is he like, does he believe this? Does he think like he's going to be the one to like fulfill these end time prophecies that like everyone on the internet keeps talking about? And the other thing that was really that it was weird and it's been nagging me is like, okay, Trump did this interview at Mar-a-Lago with these Israel elites. I don't even know who they were. I'd have to go back and find the interview, but it was two guys from Israel and they were asking him, you know, like how, if you come into office, how are you going to handle this? What are you going to do? And they were really tough on Trump. And it was so crazy because like everyone in the comments of this video, they were like, um, is Trump on a job interview? Because it feels like he is like on an interview and these people are interviewing whether or not they're going to allow him to like be president. And the craziest part about this was Trump looked like nervous. Like it was the only time I've ever, ever, ever seen Trump not hold the dominance in the room. And that kind of was like weird to see. And I'm I'm like, okay, of course, not all Israel, but are the elites, the tippy top of Israel, are they like the head of the cabal? Because if there's anything that makes me think it, it was that video with those guys and Trump. So like, what do you, what do you think about this? Did you see the video? Was that like before he became president, like years ago? No, oh, this was like oh, a recent. few weeks ago. It was very oh. recent. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Like, that's interesting. And also mm -hmm. like, if you take a look at, I mean, like we say frequently, obviously Netanyahu has something on Biden because like the narrative that's going on in our country and especially what, like we talked about last week with the differences between Obama and Biden, how they want to handle this when we know Obama's pulling the fucking puppet strings, but yet right. Biden's still, you know, it's like there's a whole bunch of shit going on. But I do want to point out, I read this article. This was in the Times of Israel back in 2020. And it was talking about there was a survey that was done in, in like December of 2019 through January of 2020, where they interviewed 16,000 people from 16 different European countries like Austria, Belgium, the Czech Republic, France, Germany, Poland, and other countries. And the survey results found that one in five Europeans believe that the Jewish cabal runs the world. And I guess like the fact that the word cabal like originates from the Hebrew word Kabbalah probably lends to this idea as well. But like, I feel like nothing would surprise me at this point. Like we, yeah. we know there's the elites, but we don't know who the fuck they are. We, we think we know who they are, but do we really know who they are? <laughs> Right. Well, and then you have that whole series, The Fall of the Cabal, which the lady was, you know, taken out or or died, you know, suicided. whatever. Suicided. Yeah. Suicided. Um, but according to all of that history, it was it's not the Jewish it's not the true Jewish people. Right. It's this group of elites that it, it's a guys. It's like they are pretending they're Jewish, but really they're like these um, Baphomet Baal worshipers, you know? And so it's not so like, but I, I can see that, you know, I do think there's this group at the top and it's just, it's very interesting. And then the other thing that makes me think this could be true is 
there was a video. I might have even played it on a past episode. I don't remember. But it was a prince from Africa. And he was doing this video and he was like laughing at Americans because he's like, all I hear every day is Americans talking about this Illuminati, this cabal, the people pulling the strings. And he's like, it's Israel. It's everyone in the world knows it's Israel, but the Americans that are obsessed with conspiracies. <laughs> and he's like, you're idiots, you know, like wake up people. And I was like, is that true? Like, does everyone else in the world look at it that way? And so I don't know. It's interesting. But again, like I, I want to make perfectly clear, I'm not talking about like Israel or Jewish people. I'm talking about like people that are pretending that have like freaking just taken over the system in every country and um, are like at the tippy top. It's like a handful of people. And I think it could be. I think they could be the cabal, especially after that interview with Trump, because I've never seen him bow down to anyone before. I have to watch that now. Okay. I'll send gonna... it to you. I'll find okay. it and send it to you. You got to watch it because it like, you yeah. have to see the tone of the room and the body language to, to truly like understand what's going on. So weird. Okay. Well, I feel like we were all over the place there, but um, I mean, who knows what to believe nowadays, right? So yeah. thank you guys so much for tuning in. Have a great day and we'll see you back here next time. If you're sick of all the crazy shit going on in our country and you want to express your support and patriotism for the show, head on over to our Etsy store at UO Patriot Chicks and check out our new stickers. The link can also be found on our website. If you love the show and you want exclusive episodes, support the podcast and join the conversation by becoming a member of our Patreon community. We'll be posting weekly member-only podcast episodes and content that isn't available on the weekly podcast. Every Patreon member will also get a free, unapologetically outspoken sticker and updates about our new sticker release before they're made public. And be sure to follow us on TikTok at unapologetically outspoken. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast. The more you support us, the more people we can reach. So help us spread the word.